In the 1980s, you were involved in punk rock, male art and neoism. You published a magazine called Smile and that's how I first came across your work. So if you don't mind, let's start with that. Can you describe what led you to produce Smile, what it was all about and how did all these early activities unravel? I was just looking at a lot of um, recent historic uh, kind of events around the art world because I decided when I got fed up with music that I wanted to be an artist but I knew nothing about how to be an artist. Um, I hadn't been to art school but I kind of concluded it was a matter of bureaucratic manipulation. So in 1982 I decided to become an artist and show that um, by manipulating the kind of systems of the art world you could uh, be a successful artist. I don't know how successful an artist I've been but I've got some kind of reputation and got work in the Arts Council of England collection, for example. Obviously that wasn't the case then, it was an experiment. And it started off with doing manifestos and being interested in kind of everything from Dada through the Surrealist uh, into the post-war material like the Situatius and Fluxus, which is now very well known, but in the um, 1980s there wasn't so much known about that, but I was very interested in those currents and also mail art and within the mail art system coming out of general idea there'd been a magazine called file and then you'd had variations on that with titles like vile so i decided to do smile because it was very banal this was um probably at end of 83 i decided to do this and the first issue was uh, printed very early in um, 1984 but it was a kind of vehicle to collect together one the poetry that i'd been writing um, and I was that was again inspired by looking what contemporary poets were doing there was a lot of interest in poetry Faber were publishing anthologies of young poets and uh, I had friends in bands who were playing uh, with drum machines starting to play with drum machines rather than drummers so they could play smaller places and uh, I was going to a, a club called uh, Sons of Dada uh, where some of my friends were playing and they'd have poets like Anne Clark um, who were, were quite well known at the time and they'd be getting up and doing poems about how depressed they were and how they lived on the 29th floor of a tower block and they'd been burgled three million times in the last five minutes and their mother had cancer and how dreadful life was and I wanted to do something very banal in response which were these little poems about fruit and vegetables and things so the poems would just be things like I, w I walked past the fruit dish smiling at the bananas they were yellow and black and kind of taking up from kind of imagism and people like William Carlos Williams uh, pop poetry of the 60s uh, but, these, uh, but also the idea of still life but in poetry so I just get up and do five minutes of those to kind of rip the piss out of the serious um, poets so-called whose work I didn't really like. So I had those poems and I had a lot of manifestos that I was writing uh, which had initially been stuck out as kind of Xerox leaflets and stuff and I decided to put it together in a magazine called Smile um, and at that point I was calling the uh, kind of movement that I was uh, trying to create Generation Positive but uh, in April 1984 after I'd put out the second issue of Smile because I had a lot of material lying around. Uh, I um, came across the Neoist, so I got involved with that. So the kind of magazine evolved through these different stages. And at the same time as getting involved with the Neoist, particularly Pete Horobin, who was at that time based in Dundee in Scotland, but had relocated temporarily to London for six months to set up this Neoist apartment festival in 1984. And it was a kind of post-fluxus, post-mail art kind of thing. So I was floating around in the mail art world and trying to understand how you got into the London gallery world. I was continuing with the interest I had in kind of fluxus and the situationists and looking at a lot of that material. I was particularly fascinated with uh, Black Mask and Up Against the Wall Motherfucker as well, who at that time were very much forgotten. So just kind of working through that material and doing the magazine, the magazine kind of evolved into a more agitational and political um, ways of uh, dealing with the art world. And at the same time, I was kind of getting into the gallery world. Uh, the first show I was in that got reviewed in the national papers and the art press uh, was um, a show called Glamour of Ruins, Ruins of Glamour, Glamour of Ruins at Chisenhale, where I was using the name Karen Elliott. So out of the neoist thing, we been doing these multiple name projects with Neosim, it was Monty Kansin, but I was concerned about um, 
the gender bias of that, so I changed it to Karen Elliott, the name I used, and for my early artwork shows, I used that. So on the one hand, we were doing the work in the art world, and the other hand, the Smile magazine, and when we did the show at Chisholm Hale with um, Richard Essex, who went on to found the London Psychogeographical Association, uh, we did a catalogue for that show, so it had some kind of um, left communist material in it, as well as the kind of uh, critique of the art world. Um, I think it was quite unusual um, at that point. I think we had a text translated from French against democracy, um, kind of a lot of these curious left communist positions uh, coming in. And the smile evolved through that, so it got seen as kind of more situationist related by some people because some of the material I was working with. And at the same time, I was also, and this is leading into um, what might be the next question, <laughs> thinking about writing fiction because I'd been also in, in 1984, uh, I went on holiday to Devon uh, with some comrades from a publication called Workers' Playtime. And while I was in Devon, I hadn't brought enough books to read. So I went in a charity shop in King Kingsbridge and I saw a copy of Boot Boys by Richard Allen, which was a book I'd read at school uh, when I was about 12 or something. And this was the series of books that started with Skinhead, went through Suedehead and into Boot Boy. Mm. And a lot of people don't necessarily appreciate that Boot Boy very much was a, a subculture following on from Skinhead. So we had the Brutus uh, picture shirts, which we all wore in the tank tops and Oxford bags. That was the fashion look. So when I was first at uh, secondary school in 1973, that was what, what everyone aspired to. And what you really wanted was um, a pair of cherry red Dr. Martins. Um, but if your mum said she couldn't afford them, you ended up with a pair of army boots like me, that the Dr. Martins were too expensive. That was a look that I've, I later discovered um, getting into punk rock, the gorillas and Jesse Hector, and he'd really perfected that kind of grown out mod barnet, um, sideburns, boot boy, Oxford bag look, although he didn't have, always have the boots, he sometimes had shoes, but for me, he's the epitome of kind of a boot boy cool Jesse Hector from the Gorillas. Fantastic um, look that he has. What I aspired to when I was 12 years old, original skinhead was maybe more associated with early reggae, skinhead reggae, Boot Boy really didn't have a music associated with it. Like Casual, it was more associated with football, um, violence, not a, mu a particular music association, although people listened to a lot of glam rock because that was the big big thing at the time. But anyway, so I saw this copy of Boot Boys and um, read it in, I don't know, an hour. And I thought, wow, this is um, fantastic. And it could kind of be used to parody some of the stuff that's going on. So in that time, uh, mid-80s, Class War was one of the uh, groups that was creating a lot of noise in the UK as an anarchist group. Uh, and I thought we could uh, take the template of the Richard Allen books or the Hells Angels books, which I read at the same time, uh, because I think it's wrong to single out a single author like Richard Allen, and uh, rework that into a story about Class War, uh, which all the people from Workers' Playtime, which I was involved with, thought was a, a hilarious idea. And it wasn't necessarily going to be me who wrote the story because what we did was we had editorial meetings, decided what was to be written, and then the task would be assigned to someone. Uh, but the magazine kind of collective broke down at that time, so I was left with this idea. So I wrote a story called Anarchist, which I then put in Small Magazine, uh, which parodied Class War, but the group in it were called Class Justice. And because you had uh, some quite a lot of rhetoric around class war about gay rights, but most of the uh, people involved were straight, um, although people like Steve Sutton, who did Wolverine, were gay rights activists, uh, but the overwhelming bulk of the kind of class war people were straight. Uh, so I had them all polymorphously, perversely gay in the story, and also had them having a leadership rivalry going on, which I, I took inspiration particularly from a book called Chopper, because having read Boot Boys, I went back and read all the New English Library fiction uh, that I'd read at school and even some that I'd missed when I was at school. My favourites when I was at school and still are are the McNorman Hells Angels books where the gay angels are even harder than the straight angels and uh, the Angry Brigade um, have kind of failed and so the angels are the last chance for freedom in a repressive authoritarian uh, Britain. But taking that stuff you could use a leadership rivalry in a story about Hells Angels 
where the um, president of the Hells Angels wanted to settle down with his mama and walk down the original outrageous ideas of the angels. And um, his lieutenant wanted to take over to keep the angels as um, a kind of pristine um, out to lunch bunch of nutcases. Uh, and apply that to an anarchist group and you immediately had a lot of satire because uh, anarchists aren't supposed to have leaders. So i have written this 17,000 word story that went into Smile, which then fed on into my, my fiction parodying uh, Class War. But that met with a lot of um, interest from people around the London ultra-left and anarchist scene, which were kind of two distinct things, but uh, they paid some attention to each other. And I think because I was writing some things about anarchism and because anarchists would like to claim things that they liked, such as the situationists who clearly were council communists and not anarchists, but uh, the anarchists would claim them as anarchists. Uh, I also got um, assumed to be an anarchist by people just because I'd written this uh, parodic material around uh, class war and some of the other anarchist groups. So I'll uh, let you answer the second question, which I may have answered already. Your book, The Assault on Culture, Utopian Currents from Lettrisme to Class War, is an intervention into the historification of the post-war avant-garde movements from the 1940s to the 1980s. What was your objective with the book at the time and how do you situate it now? I mean, at the time, it was difficult to find a lot of the information. So what I found was that when I went around the political scene in London. Uh, there were people who knew about the political aspects of the Situationist International. And then if you moved around the art world and met people like um, Rennie Gimpel, uh, who was uh, obviously running Gimpel Feast, the family gallery, um, and who had, um, you know, in storage, uh, Incredible in an old air raid shelter just off Oxford Street, an incredible number of, say, Nicky de Saint-Fell works. Um, he would know about the kind of second situationist international and I was able to borrow from him because I couldn't access them any other way, uh, copies of the situationist times which he had. And so I was interested in getting a full picture of uh, kind of fluxes and the situationists and various other groups. So I was kind of looking at the two sides of it and going to the British Library where I'd also go to read New English Library novels of uh, kind of skinheads and Hell's Angels if I couldn't find a copy um, in a charity shop or whatever, which you could a lot then. And I just wanted to make the information accessible to people. This is obviously pre-internet and it was quite difficult to access a lot of that information. And I was also managing to get my hands on books like uh, Marella Bandini's um, it, work in Italian on the situation. It's not that I can read Italian, but I had um, friends who were native Italian speakers, so they could essentially um, summarize the material I, I wanted to know about from those kind of sources. So it was just a question of putting a lot of information together because I thought um, a lot of people had a quite mythologized idea of what the situationists were. Um, I know that when I was uh, 17, I think in 1979, I went to, uh, I was going to London Workers Group sometimes, uh, which was a small group in London, which Workers Playtime came out of. Um, and, you know, you'd meet different people there and talk about different, different things. And one of the things that would come up was the situationists, uh, who some people were more into than others. And, um, you know, I remember trying to ask people about the situationists and basically I'd be told because you know, they had a kind of expensive private education. Not everyone at the group did. You also had postal workers. But I'd be told because I just had a kind of uh, bog standard state education that I was too thick to understand the situation. It's by these kind of people um, who seemed completely in awe of De Boer. I don't think it's a great idea to hold any um, figure up as a kind of guru, which a lot of people were doing with De Boer also, also to a lesser extent than Eigen. So I just wanted kind of information about the group to, to be able to circulate and people to be, be able to see what was good about the group and what wasn't. I mean, also at that time, there were people around um, in, that, in that group who were very interested in uh, Jacques Camat and Jean Barrow and the uh, kind of project of synthesizing the best of kind of council communism with the best of Bordigism, different strands of left communism. Uh, so that was a discussion that was going on and that uh, I was kind of involved with, although not at the centre of. 
uh, but I knew a lot of the people at the centre of that discussion. I thought, well, you know, what I can understand more is the kind of relationship between uh, kind of the situationists and um, the art world, and that's what I wanted to kind of demystify and make the information about available because it just wasn't there. I mean, obviously, I was latching on to a kind of what was becoming fashionable in certain circles. I mean, there's so. Uh, now I, I wouldn't bother to write the book because there's just so much information available but at the time it was very hard to access so that was the point of doing the book. You know that book came out in 1988, uh, I don't like Graham Marcus's Lipstick Traces but his book came out in 89. Um, I have a lot of uh, disagreements with his perspectives obviously. Um, and then subsequently there's just been a whole slew of books on the subject and you can find out all sorts of things. I mean, in, in 89 I went to New York for the first time, which is when you used to get these courier flights. Um, so you'd pay about 25 quid rather than 400 to get to New York, but you could only take your carry-on baggage, your little bag on, um, and uh, you were carrying business documents for getting the cheap flight. So, you know, I'd, I'd kind of found out probably as much as I wanted to know about the situationists, but I was also very interested in black mask up against the wall motherfucker. And I went to New York to, tr I was trying to locate all the copies of their publications, went to New York because I thought that was the best chance, that was where they were based. And basically went around New York asking people about um, Ben Maria and the group uh, and drawing a blank. No one had even heard of them at that time, although now they're very well regarded. But also I was, I, w I went into Emily Harvey Gallery um, and was spending a long time looking at Henry Flint exhibition, who's one of the more interesting Fluxus artists who had a critique of um, art saying that it was imposing other people's subjectivity on you. Uh, he was uh, a Trotskyite, um, but had some interesting cultural positions um, and organised action against cultural imp imperialism, among other things, which was a group that mainly consisted of him in the 60s. Uh, so he was a, a figure I was interested in because I spent so long looking at the work uh, the woman invigilating the show said to me, oh, you seem very interested. Uh, and when she heard my English accent and heard me talking about it, she was saying, oh, it's interesting. A lot of people in England seem to know a lot about um, Henry Flint and all these things. Um, ha have you read Stuart Holmes' book? And I said, oh, well, I am Stuart Holmes. And she said, oh, well, you must meet Henry. You must meet Lamont Young. You know, so I ended up meeting all these people. Um, you know, Billy Name from The Factory, who was very much in Eclipse, Carly Schliemann, um, John Hendricks from Guerrilla Art Action Group. So that gave me access into a lot of kind of New York material, but not the Black Mask stuff that I was looking for. I found all that when I came back to the UK, in fact. I, we did eventually put it all together and we put it out as a book, initially with um, popular books through AK Press. So I'd gathered all that material together, which was what enabled that kind of... Uh, interest in uh, Ben Murray to take off again and of course he subsequently turned up and I got to meet him, he's a great guy. Uh, probably is more of an anarchist than a left communist but I'm still quite impressed with a lot of what, what he managed to do in New York in the 60s and sub subsequently. Um, he's also a fantastic painter which I was less aware of when I was first looking into his work but having kind of been to his pad in Hell's Kitchen, although he mainly lives out of New York, and seen a lot of his paintings and seen him reenact performances from the 60s with uh, people like Aldo Tambellini, uh, who he worked with back then. Uh, you know, got to appreciate another side of those things and um, get into all that ma different material. But I guess I'm, you know, one of the things is I'm always just looking for interesting things that have maybe been forgotten and then trying to turn them up again, which was what I was trying to do with that book but my interest has definitely uh, waned since so much material has become available on the subject. Then let's get back to your fiction. You already mentioned the story Anarchist, which appeared in Smile. In 1989, your first full-length novel, Pure Mania, which was recently reissued, appeared. This was followed by Defiant Pose, Red London and many others. What were your early adventures in publishing? I think the novels very much came out of the short stories. There wasn't just anarchists, there were um, a succession. And then people were telling me I should write a novel. And I kind of thought, that's interesting because, you know, I set out to become an artist and I thought it was a matter of manipulating certain bureaucratic systems. Um, well, it'd be interesting to see how you get a novel published. So I'll write a novel and see if I can get a, 
a proper publisher to publish it rather than the assault culture was published by unpopular books and Aporia Press, which were not mainstream publishers. In fact, it was published by the two different presses because each said they wanted to do it, but each said they didn't have enough money. And I said, ah, oh, but I know this other press who wants to publish it. Maybe you could get together and put the money together um, and then you'll have enough to publish it, which was how that one happened. So with Pure Mania, I tried sending it to uh, the obvious kind of publishers at the, at the time, which were people like Fourth Estate, Serpent's Tale. Um, and I didn't either didn't hear back or I got very rude responses. I mean, they all liked my synopsis and would all ask to see the whole manuscript. Fourth Estate took a year to send the manuscript back and the editor, you know, had wrote me a letter saying, um, I've taken a year to look at your manuscript and what's more, when I got around to looking at it, I absolutely loathed it, basically and told me how I couldn't write and the manuscript was scrawled all over um, telling me that I was an idiot and what was wrong with how I'd done and that I was repeating myself. I mean repetition of the same phrase was something I'd deliberately done within the novel to deconstruct it. So I'd taken the idea of a New English Library hack novel um, and what I'd done is I'd run, read through so many, um, largely at the British Library, uh, that you could see whole see phrases and whole paragraphs and even almost whole books being repeated across different works and what I thought would be interesting is to collapse that into a single novel but I also found the more the repetition came out the funnier it became so you know you'd have sex and violence and it would always be described in the same way so you know when someone got punched in the face it was always the bastard staggered backwards spitting out gouts of blood and the occasional piece of broken tooth and of course, being one of my novels, people got punched in the face all the time. And every other page would pretty much have a sex scene. Um, and I was riffing on something I'd read in a Richard Allen book. It might have been under a different name, Richard Allen being a pen name for a Canadian called James Moffat, who lived in the UK for a long time. And he described sex and talk a bit about the characters. Uh, they were no longer in control of their bodies. The DNA had taken over, um, but it would kind of trail off there. And I would think that was a an interesting metaphor if you extended it. So I talk about memories of the first star exploding and of being the first amphibian to emerge from the swamps and feel the warmth of the sun on their back and extend these uh, absolutely ridiculous metaphors. And the, you know, the editor kind of sending me the rude reply obviously didn't understand that this was quite deliberate and thought out and was based on the fact that um, it being the 80s as well as left communist material I've been reading uh, postmodern works, including Baudrillard's theories of simulation. Uh, and I was interested in the fact that the Surrealists and uh, Nouveau Roman writers who I'd read as a teenager like Alain Rowe Grier um, had taken elements of pulp, um, particularly detective fiction, um, and kind of inscribed them into their non-linear avant-garde texts. And I thought that you could extend that by kind of simulating a pulp narrative, but making it so repetition that, repetitious that it deconstructed itself. So that was kind of my idea, but um, the uh, editors who were getting the book obviously thought that I was just an incompetent writer who was trying to write pulp fiction and didn't realise the kind of uh, highbrow elements, which were probably too highbrow for them to recognise. I mean, the way the Pure Mania got published was that I knew um, Peter Kravitz, who was considered a hotshot literary editor in Scotland because he discovered James Kelman and Tom Leonard and people. I was doing bits of work with him because he was editing the Edinburgh Review, uh, which I was writing for, but I knew him as a friend and I knew he'd liked my short stories. So when I was in Glasgow, uh, where he lived at the time, I gave him a copy of the manuscript for Pure Mania and he, um, I said, you know, I've got this book, no one seems interested in it. Um, maybe you could take a look at it and give me some suggestions, which is kind of, a uh, nightmare thing probably lots of people were doing to him, but he was a very nice guy um, and said, did you know I've just rejoined the editorial board of uh, Polygon Books uh, six weeks ago? And I said, no, because I genuinely didn't. I was just looking for some advice, not for a, not, not at him as a publisher, because I didn't know he'd become a publisher again. Um, and he said, well, if I like the book, I'll, I'll take it. We'll publish it at Polygon. So two weeks later, I got a message saying, yeah, the book's great. We'll do it at Polygon. Uh, which is how it got published. Uh, but Polygon, uh, because I'd had financial problems, had been bought out by Edinburgh University Press, who were a, um, 
academic publisher and they absolutely hated Pure Mania, so they commissioned all these additional readers' reports uh, which concluded it had no literary value, etc., etc., which Peter Kravitz uh, fought and basically said, um, if you won't publish this book, which we've contracted, then I'm going to resign. And he was a big deal in Scottish literature, so he got the book through, but um, under the condition that no other book by me was to be published by Polygon. Um, so that was how, how the first book came out. So it was an interesting insight into the kind of um, bureaucracy of the um, literary publishing system. You were one of the main instigators of the 1990 to 1993 art strike. How did this differ from earlier art strikes like Gustav Metzger's? What were its aims and how did it play out? The idea for the art strike came from coming across Metzger's proposal um, from the early 70s for an art strike. Uh, but Metzger genuinely believed, and I think in 74 you can understand why, where you had the oil crisis and a kind of work, a wave of workers' militancy with all the strikes and the power cuts in the UK. Metzger believed that artists, if they went on strike, uh, could destroy the gallery system and kind of gain control over the distribution of their own work. So he made, made the proposal for an art strike, but um, not many people took him up on it. And again, when I came across this, just looking through an old ICA catalogue, uh, a text about it was in the catalogue. Uh, it wasn't something that people knew or talked about when people talked about Metzger, if they knew about him. And my generation tended not to know about him, but a kind of 60s generation of art people did. Uh, they would talk about his auto-destructive artworks and his acid paintings, which I loved, but they weren't aware of the art strike. So I thought it was an idea that could be revived, but it needed to be done so as a kind of um, piece of propaganda rather than thinking that you were actually going to get artists to strike, which Mezca genuinely was trying to do. Uh, I thought it was more a way to wind up people within the art world and to kind of uh, use it as an exercise in demoralisation, basically. And I was involved with the Mail Art Network, so I mainly got networked through the Mail Art Network. Uh, mail artists not really being gallery artists or making money from their work had less of a stake in the art system. So a few people started kind of taking it up. So in San Francisco, uh, where people like uh, Steve Perkins and uh, Scott McLeod and others set up an art strike action committee. I thought, oh, this is great. So now I can tell people in London how there's this, all this art strike stuff happening in um, San Francisco and we're, we're doing it in London, whereas in San Francisco they were telling people it was all happening in London, but now they were doing it in San Francisco. And there ended up being other ones in um, Baltimore and Cork in Ireland and various places. So we were play, able in the 80s to play off that international element to generate a level of interest that we probably wouldn't have got otherwise. You know, I ended up doing a talk about it with Alan Sinfield at the ICA. I thought they, the ICA probably booked me with Sinfield because they thought we'd disagree, but actually we found out we had a lot in, in common and being on the radio and TV about it. it. It was just to get people to talk about what art is and is art a good thing or is it the culture of the bourgeoisie. Um, I'd been very influenced by Roger Taylor's book Art and Enemy of the People which had kind of helped me sort out my ideas about what art was. And uh, it, w it was just a way of kind of propagandising against a kind of uncritical attitude that art was somehow good, um, which it isn't. So I guess that was the main idea. I, I also thought it was a good idea to have an end to my project of being an artist. So at the time I declared I was going to do an art strike from 1990 to 1993, it was in 1985. And I'd have ha had a few years of trying to get into the art world, but hadn't... Um, really succeeded. I didn't know that the next year, 1986, with this show at Chisenhale, uh, which was also vandalised, which was quite unusual for art shows. And some cynics suggested that we uh, vandalised it ourselves to get the insurance money. But of course, I couldn't admit to that because that would be uh, illegal activity and fraud. Although, interestingly, that uh, Aporia Press, Ed Baxter from Aporia Press was involved in that show and it was actually the insurance money from that show put together with the money from unpopular books that paid for the printing of Assault and Culture, which was handy. But when I declared the art strike, I didn't know we were going to have that success or I was going to have that success and get reviewed in the national papers and in the art press for that show um, and kind of establish myself a notch higher in the art world. So it was good to have an end to the project. Um, when no, the 1st of January 1990 hit, 
um, it was also good to have a break. So, uh, you know, I'd read through all my marks and stuff when I'd been um, signing on the dole when I was younger. And I'd also read through a fair amount of Hegel and other philosophers. But I never read through Hegel to my satisfaction. So come the 1st of January 1990, I kind of signed back on the dole, had a bit more time because I wasn't doing these uh, cultural projects and uh, sat around reading Hegel again in English translation because I don't speak German. Uh, how worthwhile it is reading Hegel in English, I don't know. I found it worthwhile. And then at night I'd wind down with a, a kung fu film on my uh, VHS player as I'd always been a huge fan of kung fu.